you will find an Eaton Park in the center of every little community. And we love that because that's how we were founded. And we feel so strongly about those communities that we, we continue to stay there because it's an opportunity for us to provide employment for people there. It's also a way for us to provide really good, healthy meals for a, a low cost. People feel good about going there, they have happy times, they celebrate their weddings, their birthdays, their anniversaries there. And those regions are so critical and important to this region, and I think that uh, we, need, we need to be there. And we, as I said, we were in business for 70 years, and those people have been very good to us as well. For my 45 years, I've eaten there so many times, that's for good. sure. <laughs> so maybe we can just can kind of continue on down the line and make some quick introductions so our audience here can just learn a little bit more about you and what you do. Hi everyone, I'm Kelly Scalota, and I am the founder and CEO of KS Consulting and Capital. So there are two parts to that, the consulting part. I am a global, I was formerly the global brand marketing director of a major agency, and I just about um, seven months ago became an entrepreneur myself, and I do brand marketing consulting. I'm a published author on the topic. My professional passion is marketing to women and moms, so my book, Too Busy to Shop, is also on Amazon. Um, the other part of that is the capital side, and I am a co-founding member of the Next Act Fund, which is an angel investing group, uh, kind of a, a, a little sister to the Blue Tree Allied Angels, if you will, and we focus on female-run and female-led um, early-stage businesses. And so that has been a really fun and great and exciting way to support um, women in our community and around the country as they start businesses. I guess my um, most favorite and most important role is that I'm a mom, and my son is by my side today, Jake Scalota, and he and his partners have basically incubated their business in our basement, and so um, maybe we can tell you a little bit more about that today. I'm very excited about having this intergenerational entrepreneurship story, and we're gonna learn a lot more about that for sure. Hi guys, I'm Jake Scalota, I'm Kelly's son. So about two years ago, me and a couple of buddies were uh, sitting in math class. We didn't like the teacher, didn't like the class, it was algebra. So it wasn't fun. And we really weren't being productive at all in the class. We were sitting there playing on our phones. And my one buddy came to me and was like, dude, we need to be more productive in class. We need to get something done. So we wanted to make a little bit of money too. So we kind of started brainstorming company ideas. And basically, we needed to have a company that didn't require any overhead. And we could do from our phones, because we're still in high school. We can't travel a bunch. So in about a year, we founded a company called the Millennial Ad Network, and we are a youth marketing agency based out of Greensburg, where I live. After about a year of company development and a couple small projects, we uh, landed some bigger clients and have been running ever since. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm uh, Bill Ward. I'm the uh, Vice President of Operations at uh, my family's company, Ward Transport and Logistics. And we are a uh, fully integrated logistics solution provider, uh, but our primary business is less than truckload uh, trucking. And uh, we currently have uh, roughly 1,400 employees, uh, about 700 trucks in uh, 19 different locations uh, across the Mid-Atlantic. And uh, I came back to our company uh, a few years ago to uh, work with uh, my little brother and uh, my cousins. And collectively, we represent the uh, fourth generation of Ward family leadership in our company. We're in our 87th year in business, and we're at a really exciting time because we are uh, reinvesting in our company and laying the groundwork uh, to be able to grow our company for the next 87 years and hopefully uh, be able to pass the company on to our kids and grandkids. So. Uh, Thanks again for having me here today. Looking forward to uh, the discussion. Hi, I'm Chelsea Mahalko. I am from Mahalko's General Contracting and Mahalko's Fire and Water Restoration. Um, it is a second generation business. My dad started it out of a station wagon about 40 years ago. Um, so we have been in this area um, and we, we service Johnstown, Altoona, and recently moved into Pittsburgh. Fantastic stuff. What a cool assortment of companies. I love seeing this 87-year-old company. Eaton Park's been around forever, 70 years. You've made it. So a new startup based on being bored in algebra class. 
a marketing genius. Like, I'm just saying, great stuff coming on here, but with Eaton Park, real fast, Susie, I mean, about the story with Eaton Park, I just think it's so fascinating how you mentioned how it integrates into every community. I thought it was really interesting that Eric mentioned that it's not just entrepreneurials in startup companies, that there are an entrepreneurial, that the entrepreneurial spirit is in established companies as well. I think Eaton Park is a really good example. We were founded in, in 1949 by Larry Hatch, who was an executive with Isley's. In fact, he, he discovered or developed the chip chopped ham. And Larry, in 1974, decided that he needed some help and uh, pulled my husband in as the, he came from PNC, and he was the, the uh, in charge of the finances, the vice president. And as, when Jim came in, he said, we've got to be doing something different here. And it was a big boy operator, so you can probably remember that big boy that sat out in front of some of those restaurants. And it stayed that way, and we had a contract with them and we weren't allowed to move outside a certain region. You had to stay within a certain region. So and when Jim uh, and I were able to, to buy the company in the early 80s, we decided that it would be great to be able to move outside because we, had, we felt it was really important to reinvest, to reinvent. And in order to do that, we had to move, get bigger, more space, and so we, we did do that. And uh, so that generation, that first generation of our family, took that uh, opportunity to develop and change Eaton Park. You saw the salad bars, you saw the bakeries come into play, and, and uh, it, we had a really good time at expanding and doing that. But then we decided we had to really do something else, and we had our kids come back and came into the company. And so we were then into the next 30 or 20 years, 20, 20, 20, or whatever, for the 70 years and decided we had to start doing something different, and you'll see we have new type of restaurants. And, but the most important and exciting thing we did was to, to start to do a different business. We had to expand. And I think you all talked about how do you, have, how do you fund those things. And it was, as, as a private company, it's hard to do that without some different way of, of bringing capital in. But what, instead of doing that, we changed the type of business and we started a company called Parkhurst, which is the college and corporate dining. It, talk, it cost us about $2 million to start a restaurant or build a restaurant, but when you go into one of those operations in a school or in a business, you don't have that outlay of funds. So we could grow significantly during that time. So that was our entrepreneurial story. That's a Freaking awesome story, and I love it. I, actually, I would like to hear from each of our panelists about you know how they embrace entrepreneurship within their companies. I mean, it's a family affair going on right here when it comes to Scalotas. Maybe tell us a little bit about how, obviously, you know, you've been an entrepreneur all your life in many ways with how you've you know, worked and moved through Pittsburgh's community and Pittsburgh's tech community. And then your son, right? I guess I guess the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree there as far as that goes. And I just love it. I guess that's probably true. My husband is an entrepreneur too, so it's kind of runs in the family. But um, we were telling Mrs. Broadhurst when we were just talking here um, that our family environment is very um, entrepreneurial in nature. We have Jake's business partners at the house a lot. They eat a lot of food. Um, and Are you taking equity for the Cheetos and the Doritos? <laughs> a lot of snacks, a lot of drinks we go through in our house. Um, but we have a lot of family dinner conversations. We do try and eat uh, dinner as a family as much as we can. And in those, at, that, at the dinner table, we talk about, the, we brainstorm marketing campaigns, we talk politics, we talk about business and clients and lessons learned and things that go right and go wrong. And um, to the point where I think our, Ellie, my daughter, Jake's sister, probably gets pretty bored with it sometimes, but it is really a family um, discussion, and it's very much happening at the, you know, at the house. The kids use the basement truly as their incubator. Um, there are whiteboards. Um, I hear them at 3 in the morning in the hot tub, um, talking about a lot of things, but... Um, you need you know, to make a made-for-TV like, scenario <laughs> here. Like. <laughs> um, but talking about clients, and we travel together a lot as a family, too, and do business meetings. So we're headed to D.C. on Friday. Jake has some business meetings. I have a meeting. Um, my husband has a meeting along the way. So we just try and make it work as a family affair. So Jake, tell us about how you could not be an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's been really cool. Even when I was super young, 
my mom would come home and be like, Jake, what do you think of this idea for this company? And we'd talk about that at the dinner table, even though I didn't really like it back then. But uh, <laughs> then I kind of got a little bit older. I started selling in-game currencies on this one game called Rage of Bahamut. Made a little bit of money. My buddies started like a landscaping business. So we all kind of like grew up in this like social life of entrepreneurship. So it's been like a really cool upbringing. I love hearing those types of stories. I feel like the future is so bright when I hear stories like that, Hope so. for sure. So Bill, talk about the ideas of, 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 the, of the entrepreneurial spirit within your operations. Well, like most uh, businesses, our company was founded by uh, what I consider to be a great entrepreneur, my great grandfather, who uh, started our company with uh, taking out a $300 loan to buy his first truck. And you know, and 87 years later, we've grown into the company we are. But we really try to keep that entrepreneurial spirit in our company. What makes entrepreneurs successful is their ability to embrace change, to always read the business landscape, understand their customers, the marketplace. And we have to do that as a company. And the biggest threat, I'm sure Susie would agree with me, the biggest threat to established companies is that uh, an unwillingness to change. That's culture that's sort of built in that we're comfortable with where we're at. So uh, a big part of uh, you know, my job and what we're doing in our company is really trying to force some folks to step outside of their comfort zone, embrace that change, so that we're able to build that company of the future. Now, nothing is more entrepreneurial, in my opinion, than when you start a business from the back of a station wagon. I'm just saying, and I think that is so awesome. So obviously, I'm assuming that spirit has to be running through your business 24-7. It is. It's, it's still very family-oriented. We really try to push that through. But as just like Bill said, I mean, the, the struggle to change is very difficult. Um, so being in business 40 years and in a blue-collar industry, construction industry, um, you just don't change with the technology. It's very difficult to get people to do that. A lot of them didn't go to school. I mean, my dad used to have a car phone, like one of those big <laughs> car phones right in the middle. So he, he did what he could to adapt to technology, but when I got there five years ago, they still weren't using email very well. Um, I mean, this is wow. basic. Yes, this <laughs> okay. is very basic. So um, that, that struggle has finally started to just diminish. Um, but because when I came on, again, I'm a female coming into the construction industry, they're like, what does she even know what's going on? What, what is she, what is she going to be able to do here? You could have a whole panel just based on your experience doing that, I would have to assume. Right. I mean, it's um, our the technology has totally changed how we operate internally as a business. Um, so it's been, it's been amazing. Um, but yes, the, the changing, the to making people change and to under, for them to see it to see why you have to change. And because the industry is changing, we're now a leader. Um, I mean, we're getting na re rec national recognition um, because of what we're doing as a company. And it's, it's pretty awesome. So, that is fantastic. Yeah. I mean, so we talk about these, these bigger legacy type companies and the pace of change is for everybody. It's just increased and increased. And so Susie, tell us you know, how Eaton Park keeps up with this pace of change. I mean, granted, we all have to eat, but it's, it, at the end of the day, it's like it's just the pace is something where you got to make sure you're the place to eat yeah, for everybody. I think probably one of the keys to ours is we brought our, our sons came into the business and they come in with new ideas. They had gone out. It was interesting that uh, we had originally talked to them about school and where they wanted to go and, and uh, never talked to them about going into the hotel restaurant management businesses. But that's what they chose to do because they had worked as dishwashers, they had worked as cooks in the restaurants, and they sort of got hooked up and caught up in it. So when they went off to school, they chose to go to Penn State and Cornell, where they have two great hotels, restaurant management schools. And then I think that Jim was brilliant, and he said, you can't come back. You're not going to come work for us right away. You have to go get some other experiences. So they had internships while they were in school, but then they went out and worked for other people. And I think that was a really key thing for them. And they went out and got new ideas and saw how people worked in different ways. And then there were per opportunities when they came back, each one, three of them, came back with different skill sets. 
One was a great in sales, and he worked in Parkhurst and helped us get new, new business in that, that field. And another one was really good at, in the food service part, and he had gone to the Cordon Bleu and had done a bunch of things that really enabled him to think of out of the box on the type of food service and restaurants and kinds of things that we could do. And so we do have some one-off restaurants now because of Mark and what he's done. And Hello the Bistro other, is one of my favorite. I beg your pardon? Hello Bistro Hello is one Bistro. of my favorite. Good. Absolutely, we like that. Yes. And then there's the porch as well. And uh, then our other son came in and he, he was really interested in the uh, fresh food and got our farm source program going and our uh, coffee program. So they came in with really neat, great ideas. And I think that's one of the things that we have to, as people, and I, as you're saying, you're a third generation and you're a fourth generation now. Um, I'm sure each one of you, as you came in, you brought new ideas with you. And to keep it going, you have to do that. And I think that's the, that's the value in having a generations keep going. So Kelly, I, you're probably getting new ideas every day from your son. I couldn't keep up with, if I had a son that age, I'd be like, stop! <laughs> but you're probably just loving that you have like this pipeline of, of, of like, you know, energy and new ideas. <laughs> Um, I do spend a lot of time with a, lo a lot of high school kids, so yes, that is a source of a lot of great ideas. Um, as is, um, I in, I'm in charge of screening for the next Act Fund, so we, just in the past year that we've been in existence, have seen dozens of companies come in and pitch to us. So I see all kinds of ideas from many different companies across the board. Um, and we've also been big travelers in my, in my family. So um, ever since the kids were probably six months old, they've had passports and we've traveled the world. And I think that kind of exposure gives you a lot of good ideas too. And when I was at the agency for so many years, I worked with dozens and dozens of different types of clients and brands. And so what I love about what I do right now is I can kind of take that big brand, big agency experience and marry that with startup kind of smarts and agility. And that's really a very interesting place to be. That's got to be a lot of fun. So Jake, the pace of change in your line of work, I mean, I don't know how you stay on top of it. How do you stay on top of things that are moving as quickly as they are? I don't really. I just kind of... Uh, <laughs> he admitted it right now. He doesn't. Go with the flow. <laughs> yeah. But, uh, like, it's really crazy because we had a really big project a couple months ago, and we started off emailing back and forth with our clients, project updates. Then we started texting. Then they wanted us to use an app called Slack, which we hated. There's a couple of other apps in there that we were using to communicate. So every day, the kind of, like, you have to shift and figure out what you're doing differently. So, and everything just changes so quickly now with the internet and uh, like trends and stuff. You're making me feel better because as a young guy saying, oh, I yeah. can't keep up, because ah, it's been stressing me out the it's past rough. 20 years. That's it all is. I can say. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, so, I really didn't even know what we were doing exactly until a couple months ago. They were, I just kind of, did what clients wanted and made it happen. Now I finally yeah, it down. I yeah, love it, man. Exactly. That is to surf the wave, surf <laughs> the wave. So surfing waves in, in Bill's industry, uh, that's got to be rapidly moving as well, too. Uh, how do you keep pace then? I, mean, I would say the, the way we keep pace, it's nothing revolutionary, revolutionary or high tech. It's the skill of listening. Uh, we listen to our customers a lot. We have focus groups, uh, summits, things like that. And we really try to figure out what our customers want. And then we, you know, on the back end, strategize on how we can, uh, how we can best service our customers to meet their needs at a uh, price, that, you know, at a cost that we can make money on. And, uh, but it's, it's hard. With the emergence of things like e-commerce and things like that, it has really changed uh, the business from, you know, even my grandfather wouldn't recognize the customer base anymore. Uh, we've seen a lot of changes over the past even 10 years. So it's, uh, but listening, I would say, is our key way that we try to just keep in front of uh, our customers and make sure that we stay relevant and are able to uh, best serve their needs. So Chelsea got this whole conversation started about all this disruption because you came in and were disrupting the construction industry. So, so Chelsea, uh, with, with, with your business, like, what sort of resources do you need to keep yourself growing and, and, and moving forward? Um, we definitely need, um, you know, human capital, people being there and um, the talent, knowing what's going on. Um, but we also have to be, we have to stay on top of what we're doing as well. Um, we are a restoration contractor as well. So 
Um, if you have a claim, a water loss, a house fire, uh, we're there to, to clean up, board up, mitigate, restore your property. So we work for insurance companies. So we have to be on top of what they want as well. Um, it's very important that we're making sure that at every little thing that they, that they need us to get, we, we are doing. So that's what really, um, what really makes it difficult. <laughs> I was going to say, that's I a mean, lot going on. I mean, it's always changing. Sure. So, and the people there that aren't, um, you know, that haven't been used to this type of type of area and, and you know, being on top of clients and, and updating them and things like that, it's, it's very difficult for them to understand. So, um, really recruiting the right talent, in, in my case, is very important. It always comes down to talent. For if you build, is talent also as well? You need, to have the, you need to have people. Is that a problem for you guys? Is that something that you're always trying to address? always trying to get in front of? Yeah, we are in the, like everyone else, the active uh, talent recruiting market. We've had some real success recently with uh, recruiting uh, some pretty high powered uh, team members. Uh, and the nice thing too is they are willing to locate, uh, relocate uh, themselves, their families uh, right here to Blair County, uh, which is really cool. It's you know, great for our company, but it's also great for our community too. Um, I brought uh, one of our newest uh, recruits here in the back, a uh, good team member, uh, but he moved up from uh, Charlotte to live in uh, Altoona. So that's uh, really cool that uh, we're getting that kind of talent. But uh, yes, we are always in the talent recruiting. Absolutely. And so I'm sure, like, so like Jake, like, as you take on projects, you probably need to spool up and spool down talent as things happen. You're not worried about having someone full time, but as a project emerges, you need to find an expert within there get him or her going, and then yeah, get the project done. And I mean, it's really great. I'm still in high school. I can turn to my buddy in class and be like, hey, dude, we have this project. You want to help out? And normally they're like, yeah, every high schooler loves money. I want to go to high school with you. Uh, that no, would be, I would have had a much better high school experience <laughs> if I had been going to algebra class with you. Yeah. That's all I can say. I love it. So love we have it. a really cool, big pool of talent, and we definitely have to scale up and scale down. I remember... We were working on a project, and it was like a month-long project, absolutely miserable. It was our first huge project. I was spent staying up until 3, 4 in the morning. At one point, I looked at my buddy, and I was like, dude, when was the last time you showered? And he was like, <laughs> oh, like Smells like three days ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So then, actually recruited the entire Scalota family. We sat down <laughs> in my basement for a few hours, worked some stuff out. In the end, it all worked out, but yeah, definitely scaling for projects is big. You definitely have an incubator going on in your place. I want to tour of this. I wasn't kidding. <laughs> I love it. I just want to talk about talent, too, for a second. Please, absolutely. Um, because what, um, what you saw when I was at the agency, you know, you have a kind of a stock uh, group of people who are there. They're, you know, on payroll, but it was getting more flexible. But in the consulting world, um, one of the things I love is that teaming is very, very fluid. And so when I do a big client engagement, I tap talent from all around the country or even around the world if I need, but there are really awesome experts in just about anything you need, ranging from you know, video production to strategic counsel, uh, someone who could have you know, dozens of years of experience working consult or working with a big company to someone who just started, um, you know, I consult with the Millennial Ad Network on things. Um, and clients are very receptive to have that liquid teaming um, as long as you have really good resources. Without a doubt. Now, when it comes to people, Eaton Park has the friendliest people out there. So talent is of utmost importance for you. It's critical. And when you think about it, we have 10,000 team members. And that's a lot of people working for you. And it's really interesting because the, the industry has a 100% plus turnover rate. Picture that, 100% plus turnover rate. And we're one of the low ones at 50% turnover rate. So we're constantly hiring and training people. And I think that's one of the most important things we do is the training of our employees. And we are all team members, we all work together. Um, and we spend a great deal of time, a great deal of money in, in our training of our, of our people. But the other part about it is we really work hard at getting those people to feel like they're part of the family. And it's a family business. It's a family restaurant chain. And we want our team members to smile, as you said, when people come in. Absolutely. And so they feel good about where they work. They have 
many opportunities for volunteering. We have like the Children's Hospital campaign. They feel so good about that when they see that they're giving something back to the community. And so we really spend a great deal of time and effort in, in working on keeping our, our team members happy and uh, we give good benefits. We have lots of good people out there that uh, are happy to be working at Eaton Park. So it shows day in and day out, that is for sure. You guys are definitely doing something right, positively impacting so many lives. Um, succession planning, for these family businesses to go on, they have to go to the next generation, and that can be tough stuff. And it probably weighs heavily on everyone out there thinking like, who is the next management level? You know, how is this gonna, how is this gonna move forward? So uh, maybe, uh, Susie, you could tell us a little bit about you know, how Eaton Park has been able to you know, successfully bring this to the next, next generation. Well, my husband and I are footloose and fancy free because we've transitioned. But uh, it, it's been a really interesting experience. Our boys, as I told you before, we have three sons, and they um, all really seem to embrace the business. But when they were young, they worked, and they, as I said, they were dishwashers. And we weren't sure we weren't pushing anybody to come back into the business at all. When they went off to school, uh, during those early years, though, we did gift stock to them, thinking that that would be an appropriate thing to do to get them to feel good about the company. And it was interesting when they started to come back, uh, thought about it, they went to work other places, as I told you before. But when they, they grew up, I will say, um, they, they said, you know, there are opportunities there and we would love this business. So we were very fortunate they came back. But I will say that there was one thing that I would recommend to everybody here. We have a fabulous board, and that board has outside people on it. And those people were mentors to our kids, and they helped them realize the opportunity that they had. They helped them learn their skills, and they were very, very supportive. They sort of took our, our sons under, the wing, under their wings and uh, helped them to move forward. And I think that was a big part of them deciding that they'd really like to stay in the business. We now have our oldest son is the uh, uh, president and CEO of Eaton Park Hospitality Group. Our middle son, or our youngest son, is in charge of, um, oh, he does everything. He's the one who is the cook, and he tries to figure out the new restaurants we're going to have. But he's also in charge of our, our corporate um, business in Parkhurst. And then our middle son is on the board he was in charge of the, as I mentioned before, doing the uh, food service for different, well, the, the fresh food being, I'm stuttering here, I'm sorry about that. But he is now doing his own thing, but he's on the board. So we've been very lucky to be able to transition this. And it was, was really fun, Jim and I had the best time. We got a letter about our, our granddaughter who's going off to college, the oldest one. And one of the things that she said she wanted is she hoped she could be a restaurateur. So we may have a third generation. I think you have a third generation, home. absolutely. So Kelly, I feel like your succession plan's already in place here. <laughs> I don't know, Jake, do you want to do marketing to women? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just thinking, I hope, I don't have to worry about a succession plan here too soon. <laughs> we're, we're so new to this I that know. succession planning is, is kind of a foreign concept. Absolutely. But um, we do seem to have something happening here in the family. That's and, what I'm calling out. And to Susie's yep. point, I think um, you know we do tap a lot of outside expertise, and we know a lot of people in the industry. So while it's not a formal board of directors, we certainly have a, a lot of informal board of directors, right, including Dad. Including Dad. Yeah. And the dinner, the dinner table uh, as well. Yes. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Very very cool. So uh, Bill, succession plan. I mean, people are banking on you here. Fourth generation. How about the fifth? Yeah, it's, succession planning is, I would say, as a family business, it's one of the most difficult things you can grapple with. Um, you know, you have your family dynamics, you know, which everybody, you know, knows your own family. You know, those dynamics associated with that. As well as it's uh, passing a business from one generation to the next is not cheap either. Uh, our tax laws don't necessarily make it uh, conducive or easy to do so. So. Um, I do agree with what has been said. Outside influence is a very big part of a successful transition. We're in the process of restructuring our corporate governorship and our board of directors. So we have one board 
that is primarily made up of outsiders. Uh, and that's where executives in the company will report to that board and be held accountable for results. And then on the flip side, you have a kind of a family board of directors uh, that will choose the, uh, the directors on the other board, you know, as well as sort of um, work through some of the succession planning and family dynamics and things like that. But uh, that's sort of where we're heading to kind of get that outside influence and be able to run our business um, as any other business would run with accountability and results driven things of that nature, but then also uh, have an avenue for every family member and shareholder to feel uh, valued and respected and their opinions get heard. Of course, and Chelsea, what are your I thoughts on I wanted to on touch movement? on Susie's topic yeah. about um, working elsewhere, um, because that is what I did. So after I went to college, I moved to Pittsburgh and I worked for a commercial real estate firm, a uh, Fortune 500. So I was able to see a lot of different things and how perfectly a company of that size was run. Um, so when, when I got married, my husband is also an entrepreneur, um, you know, he's talking about the family business and stuff and it looked, it just looked like a really good opportunity for us to move back to the area. Um, so essentially we are one of the boomerangs that have come back to this area and um, to, to step into the family business. There really was no succession plan. My dad really did not have one. Um, so it was, it was nice to, to have him have an open mind about it um, because he was scared. You know, my dad and I, we, we get along, but we, we argue. We like to argue. So that's just what we do. Um, but we, we really, at work, it's so different, you know? And it's funny, as soon as we step out of the office, we go back to arguing. So it's just, <laughs> it's, it's all in how it worked. And he really, he really was open-minded about it. Um, and he let me do what I needed to do. You know, I have to lay everything out for him and say, this is, this is why we need to do this. This is why, um, you know, these insurance companies and customers are expecting more of us. And um, we, need to, we need to make changes, so. I just love this insight. We only have time for one more question and we've got to wrap things up. We have so much more coming on. I always want to know what inspires people. What gets you up to do what you do every day? Because everyone here puts 110% of themselves into their, into their work every single day. And we, as we all know, the pressures of life can be monotonous sometimes, but everyone here is so passionate. Something really rises up and makes you you know, do what you do. Susie, what ways what it makes you every well, day? I didn't, I wasn't involved so much in the food service operation, but I was the corporate, in charge of corporate giving for the company. And believe me, getting up every day and thinking about what we can do in the communities, how we can give back. We gave 5% of our pre-tax dollars away, and I was in charge of that. It was exciting. So I, I hopped out of bed and said, what are we gonna do good today? Love it, very cool. How about you, Kelly? Um, I would say three things. One, my kids and my family. It's great to be um, an example to your kids and you know see them doing great things. Um, two, I'm a big proponent in um, making sure that women get um, opportunity and funding. And so um, making sure that ha that happens, diversity and inclusion across business, whether that's a board of directors or your company, um, is really important to me personally. And then I think I'm just a competitive person, so I like to just I get up it. and get it done. <laughs> I can see that. And I know it's on the algebra class that's getting Jake out of bed every morning. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, original motivation was just that I was a broke teenager and wanted money. But as our company's kind of grown and we've met some really cool people with really cool products, that started the shift to older people need to be connected to younger people for the success of business and for the success of my generation. So kind of helping bridge that gap has been a really cool thing that I've been involved in. Very cool, very cool. Yeah, I would say for me, it really comes down to the, you know, 1400 families that are, you know, depending on this company to put food on their table. Um, you know, I'm very proud of the fact that we uh, pay our, uh, team members very well, you know, and that they're all family sustaining jobs. So that, uh, that's a big motivator for me. You, you watch the news and things like that and you get this, the pictures painted that, you know, business is a evil thing and everybody that owns them is evil and things like that. We have so many great examples in our community of businesses that really care about the community and give back to the community. And uh, for me, that's a really important part of why I like going to work every morning. And last but not least. 
Well, for me, our yeah. name is on the building. Oh. So that means a lot. <laughs> so it represents everything that you are. So when you say who you are, you know, people either have had a good or a bad experience. And hopefully it's always a really good experience. Your stories are awesome. Thanks for taking the time and educating us all and inspiring us all. Thanks so much.